here we are with uh, Pastor Alvin Kibble, an icon in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and also a very personal friend to many, many people. Alvin, thank you for the opportunity of doing this documentary on you. How are you doing in your time of retirement? Well, retirement has its own challenges, uh, Richard. Um, much of it, of course, uh, is, is health related. But um, uh, uh, where are you now, Alvin? Where, where are you living? We're, we're living in Menifee, California. But um, because of COVID, um, we have limited our, our activities quite a bit. Um, we do have a nice uh, garden in the back of the house. And we enjoy sitting out uh, in the sunshine. That's something that we enjoy. Um, when it's a, a little warmer, we will go to the beach. We have our, our beach chairs that we will take with us. Alvin, we know that your, your family that you grew up in played uh, a significant role into the person that you are uh, today. So what kind of role did your family and your dad especially play in developing the person that we see today? Well, my, my family has had a, a long history with the uh, with with the church, um, my grandfather, uh, Elder William Winston, was one of the one of the pioneer African American ministers. Uh, he joined the church under the preaching of Ellen White in 1909, and um, and he was mentored um, by Elder Sebastian and and Elder Bradford and uh, and. Kenny and and so many of the other um, the Man brothers, so many of the early pioneers. Uh, he he pastored in uh, Paducah, Kentucky. He pastored in in um, in Charleston and in 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 um, the Carolinas. He pastored the Atlanta Berean Church and. Then, of course, my father, um, he and Elder Harold Singleton were the two first African-American interns in the church in North America. Uh, when they graduated from Oakwood, Oakwood College, they sent my father to Texas. Um, he was called a state man, and his responsibility was to evangelize the state of Texas. They sent Elder Singleton to Florida, and he was assigned to do the same. They gave him, they gave my father a bus pass. He didn't have a car at first, so they, they gave him a bus pass where he could travel from city to city. And my mother said he would he would leave for a week with his suitcase, uh, his valise, um, with boxes of the present truth and his stereopticum. The stereopticum was what we would call um, his computer. Oh. But the, the stereopticum was a machine that would show glass slides and he would use his glass slides to give Bible studies. He would pass out the present truth, get back on the bus, go to another city, pass out the present truth, go to another city, pass out the present truth, go to another city, pass out the present truth and go home. And then a couple of weeks later, he would go back and canvass the communities where he passed out the present truth to find out if they had any Bible questions. If they did, he would start a cottage meeting. And then based upon the success of the cottage meeting, he would, he would have a, a, a 13 week um, crusade or evangelistic meeting and plan a church. Um, were you aware of these various meetings that he would go to and the bus pass and moving from one city to another? No. When, 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 when I was born, I was born while my father was pastoring the Shiloh Church in Chicago. Okay. And at that time, uh, this was prior to regional conferences, um, but he was pastoring the Shiloh Church, and then 
after that, the, the regional conferences were organized and, uh, and he, he pastored the Bethel Church in Brooklyn, New York, before being called back to Chicago to serve as conference president for the Lake Region Conference. <clears throat> now, what did you see in your father's work as a pastor that influenced you to choose to be a pastor? Well, my parents loved the church and their life was very much centered um, around church activities. In fact, um, my, my wife, I have to tribute my, my wife with having taught me what a vacation was because I thought that a vacation was when I got a chance to go to um, uh, a place with my dad and my mother and we could stay in a, a hotel and eat at the Howard Johnson's. So we had been married for a couple of years. She asked, well, when are we gonna go on a vacation? And I said, we, we do that every year. She said, no, we don't. I said, yes, we do. She said, no, we don't. I said, well, we go to camp meeting, don't we? And she said, that's not a vacation. And I said, well, <laughs> I did a week of prayer um, for, for Elder McCoy uh, down in Greenville, Mississippi. You got a chance to go there. She said, that's not a vacation either. So vacations for me growing up were really centered around church activities. Wow. Now, can you recall at what age you made a decision to become a pastor? I didn't want to be a pastor. Oh. I was, I was trying to be anything but a pastor. My, my, my grandfather was a pastor. My uncle was a pastor. My three older brothers were pastors, Harvey, Herman, and Harold. Um, but the, the, the teachers at the Bethel Sabbath School um, in Brooklyn, New York, when I was in, in, in cradle roll, they would ask me, well, no, Alvin, what are you going to do when you grow up? Are you going to be a preacher like your dad? And I would tell them, no, I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a cowboy. I'm going to be a space cadet. And they would shake their head and they would say, no, no, you can't be anything but a preacher. Well, I found out that those ladies had a prophetic vision. I was, um, I was attending Atlanta Union College uh, in, the, in the early 60s. <clears throat> and one summer, my father suggested that I try to get a job with Elder, Elder, Elder Cleveland. Um, Elder Cleveland was holding an evangelistic meeting in, on Merritt Boulevard in Queens, New York. And um, it was really designed for seminarians to participate. But um, I asked Elder Cleveland if I, could, if I could work with him and he gave me a job and I was able to obtain college credit the meeting was for 13 weeks every night except Thursday. And um, we did various jobs uh, for Elder Cleveland. We ran his projector. We um, took care of the tent. Um, we, um, we promoted the meetings. We did lots of different things as, uh, as tent staff and evangelistic mm -hmm. staff members. Um, the first series of meetings, we had a baptism about four or six weeks into the campaign. And um, we had staff meetings on, on a daily basis. At the baptism, once it was over, Elder Cleveland and I met up in the Linden Boulevard Sanctuary. And he asked me, well, Alvin, what are you going to do when you finish school? Um, are you going to be a minister like your dad? And I gave him my spiel that there were enough preachers in the Adventist church, um, enough Kimmel preachers. I was going to do something else. Well, Elder Cleveland kind of shrugged his shoulders. And as he was walking down the aisle, 
he turned around and pivoted a bit. And he said, you know, Alvin, he said, uh, in the Bible, there was a whole family that was called into the ministry. Uh, you'll remember them. They were the Levitical priesthood. And he left it at that. Didn't say anything more. Well, that planted that idea in my head. And uh, during the summer, I thought a lot about it. I remember one night, I was uh, we were living out in Hempstead, New York, and I couldn't sleep. Uh, the meeting was was moving along nicely, and I knew I was going to be going back to college in early September. And I had this conversation with God. I, I don't know why you need me. Uh, you got enough kibbles in the in in the ministry. I want to do something else. And uh, the Lord impressed me that he was extending a call to me individually, that this wasn't uh, uh, let, let, me ask you, Alan. let me ask you, Alan. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. Was it an impression you got from God, or did you hear some audible voice? I was having a conversation with God. Now, when God speaks, God speaks with the accent of Scripture. I, I, I share that with people all the time. Uh, if you really want to hear God's voice, you need to read God's word because when God speaks, he brings to your mind the things that he has said and you hear them reiterated in your mind. But at the same time, you're having this conversation and, and, and God speaks through scripture. He brings back to you the word of scripture and and the lord impressed me that 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 he had plans for me to become an adventist minister uh, and when i had the next conversation with elder cleveland i said well i i guess you got me and he laughed to himself hunched his shoulders and said i knew that all the time so i went back and i changed my major um to uh, from psychology to theology. Okay. And um, ap after Oakwood, what next? Did you go to the seminary or did you go, did a conference pick you up? I didn't attend Oakwood, I attended AUC. AUC, At that's right. AUC, Atlantic Union College, yes. My father attended o uh, Oakwood. He and my mother met on the campus of Oakwood mm -hmm. uh, in 1927. Um, but uh, when I went back to AUC, I changed my major, and um, and I really never looked back after that. Uh, I, I realized that um, that the the ladies in the kindergarten and cradle roll division were right. Um, that was really what God had in mind for me. Okay. So so after AUC, what happened then? Uh, like most of the Theology majors, we had to we had to try to get a sponsorship to go to the seminary, and I, I sent letters to all the presidents, regional presidents in North America. Um, well, Elder Elder Hudson had just died, and um, he he did not respond, but I I, I did get a response from a few others that said that, well, I, I, I wrote the president of the Lake Region Conference, who was out of Bradford, and he said that he had to give preference to the, to the uh, young men in his field. Well, I had grown up in Lake Region, but I was in Northeastern now. And um, as I said, Elder Hudson had just passed. Elder Earl contacted me two years later and informed me that he found my letter in a box underneath Elder Hudson's desk. By then I was already employed. I, I, w I received a call to the- You were employed by Northeastern? No, I received a call to the Allegheny East Conference. Elder W.A. Thompson had just been elected president. The conference had just been split from Allegheny to Allegheny East and West. And he extended 
a call to me in the summer of 1967 when the conference had just just started and um, he sent me to the seminary very good um and and so you told elder bradford thank you but uh, i'm already employed not well, elder, no. bradford, uh, elder bradford right uh, elder elder bradford had already declined because yeah. of, he said he had to and and i didn't get the letter from elder earl oh. until i was already pastoring in, in the uh allegheny east conference southern alvin all your years up until you went to the north american division those years were spent in the allegheny east conference that's right okay. now what position did you come as a pastor to allegheny east i started out as as a associate pastor of elder jc smith john smith he was pastoring the berea temple center in his church in baltimore and um and I, um, I became his associate. Um, that was in the fall of uh, of nineteen of nineteen sixty nine, and um, I um, I was assigned to help get the Oswego School ready for for school. They had just purchased new property. And my job was to coordinate the renovation of the building so that they could have it, it prepared for school. We now have with us Gwen Bradford Norwood, who was the administrative assistant. I, in fact, that may not have been the title. So. Ms. Norwood, tell us what was the title when Elder Kibble came into the presidency? Well, as the lead secretary for the office of the president, I guess you could say executive administrative assistant. Executive administrative assistant. Yeah. Now, let me ask, when he came into the office of the presidency, was the was the conference office was there a buzz was there excitement you know kibble is coming or was there fear oh kibble is coming so what was the environment taking place in the conference office well elder kibble had already been in the office because he was the ministerial director hmm. so this has had been the the pattern that allegheny east had ministerial director worked along with the executive secretary and they just it flowed so everybody knew that this what the that was the flow what was the flow going to be and because his personality was such that he he had a personality that he believed in in whining and dining his his people i went into the into the files and i saw a list of all the restaurants that he had taken us to he believed in making sure that everybody felt comfortable and it was a it was a kind atmosphere he believed in travel and taking police people places and so it was it was not fear it was we've got a new leader let's learn how he works and and move on do you remember what year he actually came to the conference office and was he coming from a particular church into the conference office? He came to us from Trinity Temple, where he had been there for several years. New Jersey. Yes, and then he came in as executive secretary, and then they also worked along with, he worked with the ministerial directorship. And then when Elder Van Putten chose to go on into the North American Division in 1988, in January of 1989, Elder Kibble was at the last executive committee in 1988. He called me and said, Gwen, I was elected to be president mm -hmm. of Allegheny East Conference as of January 1989. Wow, wow. And you moved, were you serving with him at, at that time? Yes, I was, yeah. I was working with him as in, in the ministerial de department. And then when he became president, he said, Gwen, I want you to go along with me to that particular office. And I've been there since 1989. His organizational skills, what were that like? His, he was easily understood, and the paperwork he was excellent with. I had no problem with his checking in and making sure that things flowed properly, and that there wasn't any confusion. It, you, you knew the Spirit of God was in that place, and we worked together as a good team. 
you said something that I want to uh, follow up on. The Spirit of God was in that place. So what did that look like when you say the Spirit of God was in that, meaning the conference office? Mm -hmm. So what was it that he continued or what was it that he brought in that let those employees know the Spirit of God is in this place? Well, the thing is, like I said, how he interacted with us and and like I said, he made sure that we had the opportunity to travel and to go places and to do things. And he he was concerned when his things were happening in the employees' families. And he he showed a spirit of compassion. Mm. You know, it wasn't just like I'm the boss and you do what I tell you to do. It, we didn't have that kind Did of attitude. Did he ever get that way? There was were there sometimes that he yeah. had to say, "This is what I want and this is what I want." He might have said it to somebody else, but I never got that. Okay. <laughs> It might have, he might have had to get busy with some of our employees, pastors who weren't, you know, living up to what they were supposed to be doing, but I never came across that. And when he did that, it was done in such a confidential manner that it wasn't public news all yeah. over the office. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. Now, is there any significant changes that he brought about, whether when uh, he was the ministerial director or when he left as president? Is there anything, is there a significant change that he brought in, or a significant improvement that he brought in that comes to mind? Well, we are, in our um, mission statement, it says, Te Ethne, and while he, when he became president, we didn't just have Spanish uh, churches, we ended up with Haitian churches, we ended up with African churches, and all of these different nationalities. So Allegheny East is a, is a multi, even though we're primarily African American, I looked it up and we have people from um, Haiti, Korea, Latin America, Telugu, Ghana, Indonesia, other nationalities, and they, and they feel comfortable, and they told me, mm -hmm. they feel comfortable coming to Allegheny East because Believe it or not, they were being treated in other conferences like we used to be treated. Mm. And they felt comfortable and they felt like they belonged here in Allegheny East. Wow. Now, earlier we were talking, to what degree was Elder Kibble involved with the regional retirement program? Elder Kibble was one of the main people to help pull that together. And like I mentioned to you, all of the presidents he was able to talk to, all of the regional conference presidents, they all had to sign off on this paperwork. And he said, go and go get those signatures. And I had to call and fax, but with the help of God and with his persuasion, they all signed on. And nobody is disappointed mm. today because of the type, because of what was happening with the amount of monies that came in through the regional retirement plan in comparison to our NAD plan, people are rejoicing. Yes, amen. How long was Elder Kibble's tenure in the Allegheny East Conference from the time he came in from the church in New Jersey until the time he left as the president? He, I, I mean, left the presidency. He was here about 16 years. He came in in 1984 and he left in 2000. Okay. So uh, it was about 16 years. And what position did he go to when he left? Well, when he left here, he became a vice president at the North American Division. Okay. Now, let me ask, back then, did Allegheny East have t term limits? We had, um, I would say yes, because they're allowed to, in other words, at one time, the person could just keep going and going, mm -hmm. but now they can, they can serve two full terms. Yeah. And that used to be just three years, but now the term is five years. Yes. So the, the most they can serve is two, two five-year five year term. terms. Okay. Thank you so much. We've been talking with Gwen, Gwen Bradford Norwood, who was the executive administrative assistant to Elder Kibble. We have the treasurer of the Allegheny East Conference. In fact, it's the vice president for finance of the Allegheny East Conference. It's Lawrence Martin. Lawrence, what years did you work with uh, Elder Kibble? Uh, I worked with Elder Kibble from the year 1984 up until the time he left in 2000. And in 84, he came to the conference in, in what position? Uh, he came to the conference, I believe, as the ex executive secretary. Executive secretary. Right. Now, when he came into the presidency, what impact, if any, did he have as the president on the annual budget of the conference? Uh, he was very instrumental. Uh, we would sit down together and he would go through the entire budget 
uh, pointed out those areas where he wanted to focus evangelism, hiring of the pastors and the Bible workers, and even with the teachers in, the, in education in the school and the academy. Okay. Now, yeah. men mentioning that, you know, many boarding schools at time, especially Pine Forge, money, the shortage of money is significant. Now, what was his relationship and what was his attitude towards Pine Forge Academy if there ever was a need for money? Probably his, his attitude was uh, he would um, provide any resource that was necessary to the school in order for his survival. Excellent. Yeah. Wow. Did that at time put a strain on the finances of the conference? No, it probably did. The uh, biggest thing it probably did, it delayed us in building our office building mm -hmm. because the idea was to get the academy out of debt mm -hmm. and have them debt free before we could go into building the new office building. Okay. Yeah. You know, and maybe many people do not understand that the conference under the leadership of, of Alvin Kibble and maybe Pastor Cheatham also delayed the, the building of the Excuse conference me. office. They stayed in an old building. Uh, that was probably falling apart, but because of their commitment to Pine Forge Academy and Seventh-day Adventist education, uh, the lovely structure that they have now was delayed. So it's, it's reassuring to understand that, that Alvin Kibble had that kind of connection and dedication um, to, the, to the academy. Now, at camp meeting time, <laughs> in order to kind of close in or make the budget for camp meeting possible, Elder Kibble would often make an appeal, and I've sat in under the tent and I've heard his appeal at times. So, what were those ap appeal like? And to your recollection, what was the most money that was raised during one of those appeals? The appeals were long. They yes, were, they were long, but they were always innovative. <laughs> you know, he always had an uh, innovative way to do it. Uh, but at, in the end. Uh, he raised he raised the money. Yeah. Uh, the highest he's ever raised is seventy five thousand dollars at a camp meeting. At a camp meeting. At a camp meeting. Seventy five thousand dollars. Yes, yeah. I can remember the length of some of those appeals, quite lengthy. But it always seemed that God blessed them and blessed those who were there to mm -hmm. give as as they listened to the appeal. Now, my my final question with no sorry before my final question, uh, the retirement program that the regional conference now enjoys. What impact did Alvin Kibble have on that? I believe that he had a great impact on it. He was one of the uh, founders uh, in it along with Elder McCoy, and he was instrumental in pushing it through the North American Division. Yeah. yeah. With and his influence and his charisma, yeah. yeah his <laughs> influence and charisma, that, that is true. And uh, Alvin Kibble is very, very charismatic. Now, my final question to you. As we look at what improvements may have been brought to the conference, what are some improvements, be it a structure, uh, be it the philosophy, what improvements did he bring to this conference? Well, in terms of the campgrounds, he brought the, uh, we, we, we built the, uh, what we call the Benny's Place, which is a snack yeah. bar on campus. We were able to demolish the old, old uh, cabins that we had and we replaced those with the cabins for the uh, Camp Davis, and then all the small provisions around the campus. He was instrumental in us constructing those. One thing that, that comes to my mind is uh, nursing homes. Uh, were you familiar with the development or the vision that he had for nursing homes? Uh, can you recall any impact that he may have had on that? You mean the retirement? Retirement. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, again, it was the idea was to establish each it, each. Uh, retirement center in each of the in each of the areas of the conference, uh, we did we do have three currently, uh, two in D.C. and got oh boy, two in D.C. that I know of, uh, Hyattsville Metropolitan, Breath of Life Church. Um, it seems like it's one more, but I can't think of where. And, and the conference owns owns those uh, retirement homes. Uh, they're actually owned by the the um, the local group. Oh, the local group. The yes. local group, yeah. Okay. And so what impact, in terms of establishing those, what impact did the conference have office have on those in terms of establishing them? Uh, well, through Danny Davis, he was our chief liaison, and he was the one that spearheaded them all through. Okay. And the conference gave his support behind it. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. Okay, the last, my last question. In addition to the um, 
the, the, the buildings that were put up on the Elder Kibble. There is, and you've told it to me and I forgot, Te... Te Ethne? Te Ethne. <laughs> Just tell us what that means and what was it that Alvin Kibble had to do with that? Uh, that's part of our mission statement mm -hmm. to all people group Te Ethne. And he's done that uh, and instrumental in establishing different ethnic groups. Like we have African groups, we have the Haitian groups, we have Indonesian, Brazilian, um, um, African-American, you know. Yeah, very uh, good. He, he was instrumental in that. He believed in the vision. <laughs> yes, sir. Surely he did. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice President for Finance. We appreciate you being here and thank you so much. My pleasure. Dr. William Niles, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to, to, to be with us. Uh, I do recognize that, that you are one of the icons here in the Allegheny East Conference, so it's a pleasure and honor for me to, uh, to interview you and talk to you just a few minutes about Elder Alvin Kibble. Dr. Niles, I do understand that sometimes the uh, executive committee can probably get heated uh, <laughs> in terms of the various opinions that people are proposing. Is there an instant, instance that you can think of that when Elder Kibble brought a proposal to the committee, it didn't automatically go over? People didn't automatically say, yes, Elder, I'm in favor, but he had to convince them. If you can think of such an instance, how did he convince the committee that what he was proposing was the way to go at that time. Uh, let's say this. I can't think of an instance me right now because I'm talking about more than 20 years ago. But Elder Cable, as, as you know, was an art. <laughs> and and uh, if he had an opinion, he puts it on the table. He listens to others, but he did not necessarily stick to his opinion. After he heard from several people, he was able to, as it were, pull together the various opinions, presentations, and then form an opinion which may include his, but it will also include others. So it was a, co a cooperative endeavor. And that was one of the things I believe that contributed to his leadership and his success in that he, he listened and uh, he, in, uh, he implemented the, uh, the opinions, the shared opinions of others on the committee. Truly indeed, that's, that, that, that's Alvin Kibble. I think that's what uh, has made him such an icon in the mm -hmm. Southern Day Adventist Church. Well, Dr. Niles, I thank you so much for taking time out uh, to be with us and, and, and talk about a close friend of yours, Elder Alvin yes. Kibble. And the best to you because you've also made a significant and continue to make a significant uh, contribution to the Allegheny East Conference and to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So once again, Doc Niles, thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Alvin, let's, let's follow up with uh, Maria Temple. Now there was a school there and you had certain responsibilities to the school. Share with us what those responsibilities were, please. In August of, uh, of 1969, I was assigned to the Maria Temple Seventh Adventist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. The, the, the church had just acquired new property that they referred to as the Oswego School. It had been a nightclub as the associate pastor my responsibility was to oversee renovation work. On Sundays, the, the men of Berea Temple would convene and they would do renovation, mainly with plumbing and painting and uh, carpentry at the, at the new property. But during the week, 
quite naturally, they had to go back to their, their regular jobs. So I had to do the work. And so, so that was my first assignment. Now, I was, um, I was a recent graduate from the seminary, but, um, but my job was to get the school ready. A lot of times ministers want to know, well, what, what is my job? What is my job description? And, and um, your, your job description is doing whatever is necessary to ensure the welfare of the church or of the ministry that the mm -hmm. church is sponsoring. <clears throat> now, uh, it's interesting you said you were the associate pastor at, at Berea. When did you have your first church and, and um, where was that? I thought, this was, this was in August, and I thought for whatever reason that, um, that the conference was going to send me to Annapolis, Maryland because I'm right there in Baltimore. And um, uh, I would call periodically to speak to Elder Thompson, Elder William Albert Thompson was the president, and he'd say, um, just, just, just uh, do your work. Are you doing your work? Yes. He said, well, uh, that's the most important thing. But um, Elder Thompson just told me to be, be, be patient. Well, the conference committee met and in, in late September, and they then assigned me to go to the Inglewood, Jersey City, and Patterson District. And so I was introduced to uh, Inglewood sometime in early October, and then Jersey City the following Sabbath, and, and then Patterson. And and you were you were the pastor of that district, am I correct? I, I was the pastor of that I was the associate pastor with Elder John C. Smith, who had just recently been assigned to Berea Temple, but I didn't stay there that long. Uh, I, I was then reassigned, and um, and I had the full responsibility of the three church district. Let, 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 let me ask you, Alvin. Did you? sense that you were ready to have a district, even uh, you just graduated from the seminary, you were an associate pastor for a short time, now you have the responsibility of a district. Did you sense that you were ready? I was fully ready. There, there were pastors that needed um, orientation. You have to understand, my grandfather, um, was a minister. He accepted the message under the preaching of Ellen White, and he had passed it all throughout the South. My father was a minister. I had three older brothers who were ministers. So ministry was what we did. I, I didn't need orientation. I'd already been given that clearly by, by, by my parentage. Um, we were totally involved and engaged in the work of the church. After this district, what was your next move? Where did the conference move you next? Well, I, I remained uh, the Inglewood and Jersey City and uh, Patterson district for one year. And then they brought um, Pastor Jane Smith into Jersey City and they gave me Montclair, um, Patterson and Inglewood, and then they brought in they brought in Elder Elder Thomas Milton Thomas uh, to pastor the Montclair Church, and then I had Inglewood and Patterson for the third, fourth, and fifth year, 1974, the, the fall of the year. Uh, I was I was assigned to the Calvary Church in Newport News, Virginia. Now, in those days, the ministers only stayed at a church about 27 months to 36 months. That was, that was really the tenure. Few stayed longer than that. What was the conference's reasoning behind that short length of time at, at these different churches? Well, in the earlier years, uh, you may have noticed if you went to any of our 
flagship churches, Ephesus uh, in New York, Shiloh in Chicago, DuPont in what that there, as you see across the entrance, pictures of the pastors. And they may have 30 pictures that are there. Um, we didn't have a large selection of pastors. And so it was felt that you would try to spread the talent around. Elder Singleton pastored one church, and then you'll see him at the other church. You'll see him at, the, at, the, at, at several churches where they served for a couple of years, and they went to another church. But it was really designed because of the, of the talent pool, making sure that, that the talent that the ministers brought was, was shared as, as well and as thoroughly as it possibly could. How long were you in the church pastorate before you moved into the conference uh, office? And what position, what was your first position in the conference office? Uh, I stayed in, in Newport News for three years. But then the death of Elder Jesse Wagner in Chicago, Elder Jesse Wagner was serving as the president. Um, the, the Lake Region Conference uh, Committee uh, extended a call to Elder Charles Joseph. He was at the Newark congregation. And so uh, Elder Joseph left Trinity Temple and went to Chicago to become the president of the Lake Region Conference. And that was when uh, the conference committee met and, uh, and Elder Palmer assigned me to Trinity Temple in Newark. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was, that was a, a major transition because Trinity was a major flagship church in our conference. And I remained at Trinity Temple for seven years. Because of the riots, Trinity, Newark had been burned out. There was no grocery store in Newark, New Jersey during the years when I was there. All the grocery stores had been, had been burned down. Um, it, it, was, it was a blighted community. It, 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 that was really a challenge, but it was the greatest experience for me because it gave me an opportunity to really get in, involved in, in the community. Uh, uh, Dr. Ralph Grant was the city council president who was a Seventh-day Adventist. And um, so I, I, could, I could blend in with, with civic concerns and um, in fact, we, we assigned two of our members, brother and sister Hood, Melvin and Connie Hood, we assigned them a, as our representatives to sit in on Newark council meetings. And she, they would report back to the church board the concerns and the needs of the city. And we, we began to engage our ministry to address those needs. We also had the opportunity of hosting um, the New Jersey Mass Choir under oh, the leadership of Donnie Harper. They needed a place to practice. We opened our doors to the New Jersey Mass Choir. Um, they, 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 they started rehearsing at Trinity Temple. And then Donnie Harper asked me to be the, the, the chaplain for the choir because he wanted the members of the choir to know what they were singing about. So he wanted me to give them Bible studies. Yeah, and this was the New Jersey Mass Choir. This is the New, New Jersey Mass Choir. Which is not an Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist my, entity. But my wife uh, was a member uh, of the New Jersey Mass Choir. My son, Jason, who, who has perfect, uh, perfect pitch, um, would, would go to the rehearsal and help the J New Jersey um, choir members to learn their parts. That was again, an opportunity for us to engage in community ministry. It wasn't me, it was the members of our church who were in the choir. At that stage of your pastoral career, what were some of the talents that you were seeing in yourself 
that God had blessed you with? Well, I have to be honest. All I ever wanted to do was to be a pastor. God, I felt that the call that God extended to me was to pastoral ministry. I wanted to be the kind of pastor that if someone woke up on a Sabbath morning and needed a blessing, and they were within a 50 mile radius of my church, that they, they were confident if they could make it to my church, that they would get a word from the Lord. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. I know there were some talents that you were noticing that were developing, that were developing in you. Uh, leadership ability, uh, various abilities that later on became very evident in your career. Can you identify some that were <clears throat> that were highlighted at that part of your that at uh, that point of your ministry? I, I love people. There and, you go. And I I wanted to make life better for them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do something that would enable them to do better and and to make a difference, you had to be engaged in what their needs were. The, the Trinity Temple Church was tore up from the floor. I mean, it, it was, the, my, my, my first funeral was a young man whose head, half of his head was blown off in, in, in a, a gunfight. And, and, and um, the other gang members came to the graveside and made a vendetta to get the guys who killed their friend. But I had members who were related. You have to care about people. I would ask pastors when I was uh, interviewing them for possible employment, uh, do you love people? Do, do, do the problems of people energize you or wear you out? If they wear you out, go find another job because ministry is about people. People cannot, a, a doctor can't make a patient apologize for bleeding on them. And a minister shouldn't make a person feel that they, that they are, um, that they're a problem because they bring their problem to the church. You remember the man who, who, who came to Jesus, Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and, and he came down the mountain. There was a, a, a crowd that had gathered and the man approached him and said, Sir, sir, I brought my son to your disciples. But they couldn't do anything. People bring their problems to Jesus. We represent Jesus. Yeah. And if you can't take the time to engage people, then you don't need to be in ministry. That ability that God has blessed you with, as we have spoken with some of your friends and previous co-workers, that's something that is highlighted very, very clearly. You love people. You are concerned, you are concerned about their needs and you want to do whatever is in your power to alleviate that need that they've had. So when you are engaged in ministry, if you're truly engaged, God will grant you the gifts that you need. He will equip you, but you have, you need to be engaged. It ain't about you. Mm -hmm. It is about the people. So as the people came to me, God enlarged my territory, but he also gave me a, a greater ability in order to do the things that, and there's another thing. I used to tell conference presidents, I did orientation for them for almost 20 years. I said, it's all right not to know. It's not all right not to ask. You don't have to know everything. But one of the things that I took full um, 
full I exercised to the fullest of amount of my ability was that I would ask. It's, it's nothing wrong not knowing everything. Don't you don't have to fake it till you make it. That's a that's, that that is not that is not true. If you don't know something, you have a fiduciary responsibility. Ask, and I think I did a lot of asking. And I had a, 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 a large number of mentors. Yeah, who were some of you? Who were one or two of your mentors? Well, I think that Luther Palmer was certainly one of my mentors. My, my, my father, of course, um, and, and my brother, uh, Harold, they were, they were excellent. But in terms of, of contemporaries, um, Luther Palmer was was certainly one of those. Samuel David Myers was another mentor. Uh, Charles Bradford was a mentor. When I was when I was conference president, I had six presidents in my territory. They were all at my beckoning calls. Luther Palmer, he was at the Columbia Union. Me, Carson Van Putten, was at the North American Division. Um, William Albert Thompson was was a pastor in my in my conference. Um, Elder Elder uh, William, he was right right down the road. His house mm -hmm. overlooked um, the drive that I made every morning coming to the office. Um, Elder Elder Walters Walter Starks was a minister. He was my stewardship director. W. W. Fordham was in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. So I could call any one of them. You, you know what I find interesting, Alvin, that there are some administrators who believe if they have to reach out to someone to get counsel or to get advice, it's an indication of their weakness. And that's such a shame because I'm hearing that you've reached out to people who you viewed as having experience and knowledge and they could give you guidance in terms of making right decisions. But some present day administrators feel that that is a weakness if they do that. I, I, I completed 51 years and eight months in ministry. I never qualified to be an ordained anything in God's church. How do you qualify to be a representative of the most high. How do you qualify? Where do you get? You don't get that from school. You don't qualify. You, you are a debtor. And my parents had taught me that if you, if you dedicate your life to God, that, that if you need help, God will raise up friends for you. These gentlemen, they weren't just my mentors. They were my friends. As we continue to highlight the legacy and the contribution of Elder Al Alvin Kibble, we're now going to talk with uh, Dr. Gina Brown. Uh, presently, she is the dean, and she'll tell us her, what her title is. Yeah. Tell us the title, please. <laughs> the title. The Lord is gracious. That's the title. Lord is gracious <laughs> to his girl. Um, that's my title. But I currently serve um, under the auspices of President Wayne A.I. Frederick at Howard University. Um, as the Dean for the College of Nursing and Allied Health Sciences, where we're privileged to host um, 13 programs um, under that college. And just the Lord has been gracious to us since I've been there. So just just gracious. So um, that, that's going to be my key word today. God is gracious. God <laughs> is gracious, truly. Dr. Brown, viewing the tenure of Alvin Kibble in the Allegheny East Conference, you served on the conference executive committee. Now, what type of leadership, how would you describe the leadership that he brought to that body? So I, first of all, thank you for having me here and thank you for allowing me to talk about my great friend, um, Elder Alvin Kibble, the, the Everybody has been vice president. That, Dr. Brown. This man Everybody. is just <laughs> phenomenal. This, so I served under Elder Kibble two terms, 
So I served under Elder Kibble for eight years. So I know Elder Kibble well. And besides serving under him, we've had many, many meals together in Maryland um, when he transitioned to North American Division and all of that. We spent tons of time together to the point where I said to him, leave your bed with slippers at our house so we can eat. And he always volunteered to wash the dishes, which is he's like, if I'm going to eat on wash the dishes, man, just out of control. But anyway, <laughs> um, leadership style. I've learned so much from Elder Kibble. I served under him when I was young. Um, and when I say young, um, late 20s, early 30s, and so I learned so much from him um, in terms of my leadership style, in terms of being a transformational leader and a transactional leader. Transformational in the sense that Elder Kimball was before his time. He saved and garnered money in order to have the conference building that we actually have today. He saved to put the conference in the black. He worked um, tirelessly for women's rights when women's rights were not there. He uh, mediated tons of fights. It was on the executive committee. It was the first time I ever realized that a pastor could actually go to hell. Not Elder Kibble, but somebody that I was arguing with and Elder Kibble told me to go to my corner and for that pastor to go to their corner. And I said to him, I didn't even know pastors could actually go to hell, but I was, I declared that one was going to Elder Kibble was the one that really has just, um, made himself available in terms of teaching me leadership roles. So when I said transactional, transactional in the sense that he saved to, to, to garner funds again, to get the conference in the black and to make sure the conference had what it needed, transitional and transformational in the sense that he moved different things around that were not in place um, back in those days. So the relationship with the with the union, he garnered to ensure that that was much better than it was. North American Division as well, and the General Conference in terms of funding, he supported Oakwood um, fully. And in addition to that, supported um, what was then Columbia Union College as well to ensure that fairness was, was done um, on each side. He um, endeared himself to my family, making himself my daughter's grand uh, godfather. And still to this day, she text messages him. Um, but again, a leader who was ahead of his time, he gave gifts. Let me tell you about gifts. So once a year, we, you know, of course, we don't get paid to be on the executive committee. Once a year, he would give as the president of the executive committee um, with his vice president, Lawrence Martin, of course, um, gifts. We get a gift once a year. And instead of getting what we get right now, and I'll talk about the union, we get peanuts and a gift card <laughs> for like $75. 20 years ago, Elder Kibble gave wonderful gifts. Um, he gave things from, we, we, we never knew what a Palm Pilot was until Elder Kibble, which is the predecessor um, of the iPhone. We had Palm Pilots because of Elder Kibble. We had um, leather bags from stores that we not heard of as black people um, that Elder Kibble ensured that once a year we received a decent gift for all of the months and time and attention serving on a committee without pay, without recompense, without reward. This was the once a year thing that he did to the point where the gifts that he gave 20 years ago are better than the gifts that we get now. So served on the GC for two terms, never got a gift like that. And the union mm -hmm. committee as well, never got a gift like that. Very generous. Um, and, and I'll tell you my most, my fondest memory of Elder Kibble, my fondest memory of all of the years <laughs> I've known him for 20 years. We were meeting in Pine Forge um, Church because we didn't have a, a decent conference building where we could get everybody. So we used to meet at the church and get our little sack lunches and go eat behind Kimber Hall. But we were meeting in the church in one of the classrooms and they had the extended tables out. And Jill Kibble came to give him his keys or something. And she was peeking through the door, through the top of the door. And Elder Kibble looked at that door and you would have thought he had seen her for the first time in life. Mm. The smile that came upon his face. She's just getting some keys. The smile that came upon his face. Oh. I'll never forget that. And I looked at that and said, wow, I wish that one day I would have a relationship that I would look at somebody 30 years into a relationship and smile mm. and be happy to see them just because they're coming to get some keys. That is my fondest memory of Alvin wow. Kibble. Gentlemen, you've never heard anybody say anything um, that's been inappropriate, um, inconceivable, mm -hmm. loves Jesus um, to the pit of his bones, loves his family, loves his, his sons, loves his grandchildren, loves his wife, loves his church members, loves his parishioners. But more than that, um, giving, just giving and kind and one of the kindest people that you would ever meet. His bad point. Elder Kimball can take a two minute speech and turn it into 35 minutes. Oh, Honestly, my goodness. Oh it's my going goodness. to be 35 minutes. It's going to be 35 minutes. It's not going to be. He can't do two minute anything. We had him do the prayer at my daughter's wedding, whatever. And I was like, Elder Kibble, now really for real. Like this really needs to be like really short. Then he might have kept it like five minutes. But again, long, 
long, long, long. But when I tell you, if a word to describe him, bomb.com, bomb.com. Yeah. He's just phenomenal. Yeah. And so here's my other major compliment. He was wearing suits that designers who we don't even, that are, that are suits, I mean, dress, Magnani shoes when nobody was wearing Magnani shoes. Um, I think it's Zynga suits when nobody was wearing Zynga suits. Um, Gucci, Prada, mm. every designer you knew on a pastor salary, still faithful tithe and offering, yeah. still given to everybody else, but dressed impeccably yeah. forever. That's my Alvin Kimball. Let me ask one one last question. Can sure, you sure. Think of a time where maybe uh, on that executive committee, uh, he proposed something but he was attacked or was just getting uh, disagreement from the left and the right. How did he handle something like that? So Elder Kibble, when I tell you, um, there's a, there's, there was a beer commercial that used to be out and it said, don't let the smooth taste fool you. That would be his thing. Elder mm. Kibble, smooth, um, never raises his voice, an excellent a gentleman, par excellent, but he can control a room. He will shut you down. He has mm. said, that's enough, very appropriate, not in a scolding childlike way. That's enough. No more from you. No more from you. We're going to stop. We're going to pray. We're going to resolve this issue. We're going to talk about this and we're going to work through this. But he will shut it down. Now, don't don't again, don't let the smooth taste fool you, but never raising his voice in a way that was appropriate, that was professional, that was Jesus like, like Jesus cleansing the temple when he took the ropes and tied them all together and beat up, you know, told everybody to get out the temple. Jesus cleaned it out, but yeah. Jesus handled his business and he did it in a way where it wasn't sinful. He did it in a way where he didn't cuss at anybody. Jesus did it in a way where he, he let you know I'm in charge. I'm larger in charge. I got this, but this is how you're going to do this. Elder Kibble followed that type of leadership in the sense that he could tell you what you're going to do, what you were going to do. You're not going to leave mad. You're going to know he was fair. He's not going to do anything that's that's unfair. He's not going to do anything that's unprofessional. There are three things that he's not going to do. It's not going to be unethical. It's not going to be unprofessional. And it's not going to be immoral. That's mm. what's not going to happen. So yeah. those three things bottom foundational to who he was, who he is yeah. and the way he drove that process. I, you there. I, I've served again on every level of the church, church board committee, um, um, conference committee on the local level. 16 years I served two terms under two presidents. I served on the Columbia Union Conference four terms. I'll see under two and then come back for two more. I've served on the general conference committee two terms. You will never find another administrator like Alvin M. Kibble ever. ever. Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate those words. Thank you for taking time. Been my to be with my us. honor, my honor for 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 a statesman and a gentleman. Thank you. We have with us this time Carolyn Forrest, who is with the NAD. Uh, Ms. Ms. Forrest, could you tell us what was your position when Alvin Kibble worked with you, and what was his position at that time? Okay, Elder Kibble was a vice president and he had a particular ministry that he was responsible for. He cared for our, um, me well, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it the media area, but he did a lot with social media, uh, big data. He worked in that area. He was also responsible for our um, Breath of Life ministry, he worked very closely with them. And he had various responsibilities as a part of administration. And my role, and still is today, um, was that of Associate Secretary and Director of Human Relations for the North American Division. And now the Kibble's role as Vice President, how yes. would you describe his leadership style? Okay. I found Elder Kibble to be one of the most empowering, generous Christian gentlemen and I don't use that word often, gentleman. That is what he was, a gentleman, and still is to this day. Uh, very interested in hearing the thoughts and opinions of others. Very interested in knowing how others uh, felt in a, a, with a particular situation. And was patient and gracious and always encouraging, wanting to uh, promote and encourage the best in everyone. And it was a privilege to work with him, an extensive man of knowledge and information. Now, does any um, 
anecdotal story or something amusing mm -hmm. or something interesting come to mind in terms of uh, Alvin Kibble? <laughs> One of the things that uh, we always knew when we called on Elder Kibble to speak, um, you could say uh, Elder Kibble gave us the the uh, the Reader's Digest version of such and <laughs> such, and we all knew there was no such thing with him. Yeah. It was going to take some time, and we would chuckle about it. <laughs> but the amount of wisdom he had, and the things, the yeah. institutional knowledge that he had, yeah. uh, it, it was amazing. It was just yeah. amazing, and he was so willing to in in share that information with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking this time. Thank you for the contribution to the North American Division. And God has truly blessed your leadership. Thank you once again. Now we have the opportunity of talking to the power behind the force. <laughs> Sister Jewel Kibble is in the spotlight. <laughs> Sister Jewel Kibble. Yes, sir. How, <laughs> how and where did you meet Alvin Kibble? Well, first I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to participate in this video presentation honor. I uh, just want to thank you and it's an honor to do that. So you want to know how did Alvin and I meet, eh? Yes, yes. Well, I think the first time we met was casually at basketball games that um, we would have in New York City. I grew up in Mount Vernon, New York. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, but I grew up in Mount Vernon, New York. And we would have a lot of basketball games between the churches. And uh, we would frequently go to Ephesus in New York City and for their AY, or it wasn't AY, it was MV. MV, yes. And then after MV, we would go to basketball games. I think that's where I first met him. Okay. Then again- Okay, didn't North, you say this was in Mount Vernon? I grew up in Mount Vernon, yeah. New York, yeah. which is outside of uh, the Bronx. It's right yeah. next to the Bronx, a suburb of New York City. Um, but that's not where I met him. I, I, like I said, I think I met him at uh, basketball games that we would have in the city on after Sabbath. Okay. Um, and also at um, North, Northeastern Junior Camp and camp meeting. Because now we were in Northeastern Conference and not Allegheny East. Um, and then again at Atlantic Union College, uh, Alvin showed up at my doorstep one evening. <laughs> and um, I guess that kind of started our relationship. And then, um, as you said, uh, Atlantic Union College had a, role to, had a role to play. Now, let me ask this. You are a musician, Jill. Uh -huh. Now, I'm not sure how ministers and ministers' wives are today. But yeah. back in the day, I think that ministers, they wanted to find someone that could sing and play the piano. Now, did that have anything to do with Alvin's attraction to you? Because you're a musician. Right. Well, see, by then, the, the way it all started was the pastors would go to a church or a district and there was no one to sing or play the piano. So when they would look for a wife, they would look for somebody who could fill in the music for the church. Um, no, without being a cappella, they wanted um, more music for the church. And so they chose wives uh, that could play and sing. By the time I met Alvin, that was just about old school. Oh. So. Personally, I don't think that that really had anything to do with our attraction or getting together. Um, so the answer I would give is no. How many children and how many grandchildren has God blessed you guys with? We have two boys. Both of them are men. 
grown and doing what they do. And four grands, two girls, three girls, and one boy. Jill, at one point you were the school's nurse at, at Pine Forge Academy. Uh -huh. Were there other opportunities for your career to complement Alvin's ministry? Well, you know, there are two careers that pastors, pastors' wives fill. One is to bring in the money, and the other wow. one, and the I'm other sorry. one. I didn't know that one. Elaborate on that. Oh, dear. Or, okay. Um, back in the day, it's better, a little better now, but back in the day, they're really, you needed the wife to work. You needed the wife oh. to uh, kind of subsidize his salary because remember it was not really uh, su sufficient to do everything you want. You know, the members wanted you to look good. They wanted you to smell good. They wanted you to drive a good car. They wanted you to have a nice house, but the, the, um, not salary. What did you call it? Remuneration? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really wasn't quite sufficient, especially if you had children, you know. So that's why I said there are two careers. Yes. One okay, career is to bring in the money, bring in some extra money. And um, the second career really was to be a friend to your parishioners within mm -hmm. the ministry. Um, what I learned was people long for you to touch them. They want you to... Uh, pay attention to them. They want you to be a friend. They want you to. They want to be included in your life, and that I feel was the um, compliment to the pastor and or to Alvin. Well, to any pastor and his ministry. Um, the people want you to mingle, as Jesus did with people. They want you to mingle. I didn't need a a pew to myself to to sit on. So oftentimes I would find somebody in the audience that I knew or the congregation that I knew that I could go and sit with them. Um, that's a compliment. I feel that's a compliment because the people, they want to feel close to you. They want to, everybody wants to be, yes, I talked to the pastor's wife today, or I talked with the, the pastor and so and so and so, and they want you to be a part of their life because they've been there. We're just traveling through their own territory. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mingle, you know, and you, you tend to be by yourself or that kind of thing, um, the people can't really get a sense of your caring for them. They need a touch. You felt that in terms of complimenting Alvin's ministry, one of the things you did was reaching out to members in the congregation, talking right. to members in the congregation. Based on what you may know, is that the same posture our, um, uh, ministers' wives take today? A few. Um, you know, when you're working full-time as a pastor's wife, you really can't participate in every aspect of what he does um, because you almost have your own life. You have to punch in a clock, you know, if you're working full time, take care of the kids and, and um, then try to um, make yourself available for many of the services that are offered in the church. Today, I think there are a few pastor's wives that see the benefit of really getting involved with the members. I'm not saying that you have to do, you have to be Sabbath school superintendent. In, in, in fact, when we went to Newark, New Jersey, the previous pastor's wife had taught Sabbath school or was the, the, um, the, the, the secretary, the um, Sabbath superintendent, school superintendent. superintendent. And they were trying to get me to do that. And I'm like, well, that's not really my skill. I play the piano. <laughs> so, you know, and finally they got it. Um, and so I was the church pianist. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with a gentleman who uh, came from New York, 
who could play the organ and just, 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 just all over the place. And he was instrumental in teaching me to play in other keys oh. because he would switch the key and he would give me a signal. Okay, I'm in A flat. And, I'm, and so I would try to catch up with him. Um, and the people in, seemed to enjoy my participation in the service. As the wife of a baby boomer SDA minister, uh -huh. how did your nursing career oh. take a backseat to your husband's ministry, if at all? Well, it was difficult having, like I said, there are two careers. It was difficult doing all of that at the same time. Um, so my career really wasn't what you might consider as a career. How I, how I view multitasking, and that was a multitask back in the day. And I, I, I view multitasking as for the birds because you really can't do a lot of things efficient, efficiently. And so my career kind of, um, it really was in the way because I couldn't participate or I was tired or, you know, trying to accomplish all of those things, I could not participate as much as maybe I would have liked to participate because of the career. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, corporations um, demand your time. They demand you to clock in at a certain time, leave at a certain time, and that kind of thing. So you really don't have that extra time yeah to to focus or to function within the pastor's agenda because he's you know uh, responsible for the whole world <laughs> and as the wife with a career you really can't do that i wanted to finish my master's in health administration but it was too much you know it was just too much for me to do that i had had a, an idea back in the day about having clinics in the inner city to communicate with, with the, the people on just health-wise things and to um, be able to share our health principles. But I was told that um, we didn't know how to operate clinics in the United States. We could do many hospitals and that, that kind of thing in Africa but we really didn't have the, um, we really had not done any clinics in the United States. So I said to myself, well, if I get a, a master's in health administration, maybe I could kind of start that. But I really never got a, a chance to finish the um, career in health, health um, administration. So I just had to kind of put that aside and work within the structure of healthcare. I, I think in many instances um, today, many ministers' wives may say, well, ministry for the church, that's my husband's job. Yeah. But, you know, I, I have my own career. Uh, and that's my life, true. What? That's too true. That's true to some extent. Because, like I'm saying, mixing it is really difficult. It's just really, really difficult. So, a lot of the wives, the younger ones are like, they want a, you know, a career, a real career that they can mm -hmm. focus on. And it's so to some extent, what you said is kind of true. Yeah. My last question, Jill, now in retirement there in sunny California, how are you, how are you adjusting to the slower lifestyle? Well, is it a slower life? <laughs> uh, you know, when we moved out here, Alvin was concerned about being near an airport. And we would say, where do you think you're going to be going? <laughs> you know, you're going to be retired. The airport, you know, as long as it's within an, an, an hour, uh, that's, that's pretty good. It's a shift in focus. Oh. Um, you're not completely dormant. You can be, but you're not really completely dormant in, you know, what you do since you're not centered around the church. Um, it's slower because we don't have to punch a clock every day. In some way, it's boring. In fact, 
I would like to get to the point where I can do something, um, utilization, utilization review or healthcare review from home. I don't want to go in and punch a clock, but I would like to do something because, you know, it pays to kind of keep up on, the, on things and um, not just say, well, that was then and now I'm just going to do nothing. Um, you're not made to do nothing. So, um, but however, due to health challenges, I'm not really um, slower life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as most of you know, I have kidney failure and I'm, I'm working on getting a transplant. And so they require a lot of tests and a lot of things that you have to do medically to actually qualify for the transplant. It's not like you see on TV and somebody comes in the hospital and they need a kidney or a liver. It takes longer than that to find a kidney or, or a liver transplant. God has blessed me to have uh, two individuals to volunteer to share with me one of their kidneys. And the thing about that, I just have to add, you know, when a person gives up one kidney, you know what happens to the other kidney that they have? It grows. Ah. God made it so that that other kidney will compensate for the kidney that they lost. Many people don't know that. I was fascinated by that. I didn't know that myself. Um, so the, the pace is, is lessened, but it's really not eliminated because you have plenty, you know, as you age, you have both of us have um, hospital or doctor's appointments and tests and things like that. So it's slower, yes, but it's not completely dormant. Yeah, I like what you said uh, earlier that it's a shift in focus. But let me ask you this, uh, Jewel, for those individuals who may be watching that have kidney challenges. It's my understanding that even though someone may be on dialysis, it's not the end of the day. Life can still go up, uh, life can still go on. There's certain adjustments you may ha you you'll you'll need to make, but life can still go on. You can go on vacation, you can go on cruises. Um, just enlightened us. To what degree is that true? Dialysis maintains life. That's it. It doesn't cure you. It helps some people to feel better. Many people feel worse after dialysis. But for me, um, I feel better after a dialysis session than I do on the next day. I'm, you go three times a week and you have in between days, like I go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday and Thursday, and then the weekends I have off. And because the kidney, the kidney takes care of everything in your body, your skin, your hair, your, um, your diet, your, uh, um, your temperament. It takes if your heart, your blood, because without the kidney, blood can't get to your heart. You know, it, so it controls everything in your body. And so you have a lot of different things that are going on besides the kidney being malfunctioned, um, which is very interesting, but it's very, uh, sometimes it's, um, I can't say depressing, but it can, can be depressing. Because without the kidney function, your heart doesn't function. I mean, it's the kidneys are really the most important thing in your body or next to the most important thing in your body. So you, you can exist on dialysis for years. Dialysis does tend to hit your body kind of hard, but it maintains life. And so that's why, you, you know, the, some people don't want to get a, a kidney, a new kidney. But, uh, and there's so many people in the United States and the world, but really the United States, there's so many people that need a kidney. They don't have enough donors. 
And just to speak to the um, non-white population, there are not as many black donors as there are Caucasian, I'll say Caucasian donors. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, so many times um, you, might, you might have a better match in the black community. I don't know, I haven't studied that, but I know there are not as many uh, black donors as there are uh, Caucasian donors, which makes it a little difficult for black people to black and brown, non-white, I would say, non-Caucasian, um, to get a kidney because they tend to s serve the the um, the dominant population with kidneys. Um, it's a big de decision to give up your kidney, but dialysis will keep you alive. It's a little hard to go on trips because you have to find a center that will accept your insurance and accept you if they have a chair for you so that when you travel, you have dialysis available to you. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's a little difficult, you know, but it mm -hmm. can be done. Yes, it can be done. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that uh, insight with us, Jill. And I, I, again, uh, a documentary about the icon Alvin Kibble would never be complete without the force behind the power. So thanks a lot, Jill. Thank you. Again, thank you for having me.